And good morning to all. This is Pete and Dork from Sinta, the Cornerstone Assembly at Independent Pentecostal in Cambridge, Maryland, and also the Sinta Ministries. Same place, same location, same fun. Amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. We're going to look at uh, Out from the Shadow of Death this morning, taken from Isaiah, the last verse of chapter 8, and we'll take some into chapter 9. And the reason why I want to do this is because uh, coming up this week is Hanukkah. And I know Christians don't celebrate Hanukkah for the most part, but it's good to understand some of it and why the Jews do celebrate that. In fact, it has bearing upon us. It's kind of odd. It's, the, it's also called the Festival of Lights. And so at our secular Christmas time, which I call secular Christmas time, there's lots of lights outside and so on, celebrating hopefully the birth of Christ. I like it when people celebrate the birth of Christ. That's it. No... You forget the reindeer and all the sort of stuff and uh, Santa out there and all that. Got a few pictures of Santa laying down on a job. Huh. <laughs> Gotta post that. But uh, nonetheless, we'll talk about that shortly about Hanukkah. But the background for chapter uh, 9, verses uh, 1 to 6, which we looked at this morning, starts in 8, so we'll take 8.22 also. But Albert Barnes tells us that the... Uh, those chapters of Isaiah 7 and 8, before we get to chapter 9, there's promises of comfort and deliverance, while at the same time, it denounces the sins of the nation and assumes the nation, assures the nation, that the anger of the Lord is not turned away. So we want to look at a few things here, and I was going to read the whole passage at one time, but you should be there by now, hopefully at Isaiah chapter 8, verse 22, and then you turn the page, or you Forget that it says chapter 9, <laughs> and keep on reading. But uh, we do want to look at that now, and let me bring that up on the screen for you, as I try to see at this time. I always have trouble finding those things. Okay. All right, let me see. Audio message outline. Oh, there it is. Okay. The font is not big enough for me to see from this distance, and I'm only like, what? two feet from the laptop. Isn't that wonderful? All right. But here's the, the first verse that we're going to look at. It's at the last verse of chapter 8. Then they will look to the earth and see trouble and darkness, gloom and anguish, and they will be driven into darkness. Now, uh, this touches upon what will come upon the earth, particularly in reference to Israel slash Judah, more so Judah at this time, because, well, Israel will be taken captive ready and so on by that time. But uh, when we look at this verse about this darkness and so on, they'll be driven in darkness. When you look at the Old Testament, your last Old Testament book is Malachi. And he is the last known true prophet to rise up and, and have something recorded. And so uh, Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament. And from Malachi to the time you get to the New Testament, we have about 400 years of silence. That's a fast from hearing the Word of God. So, it's not that no other books are written. In fact, we could read some of those books called the Apocrypha. And I have read about half of that. There's a lot to read there. And so, uh, but the thing is, they're not part of God's Word. The Jews never felt that they were part of God's Word. And nor did the early Christians. Now, so after Malachi, there was no prophet that rose up. But what did happen which touches upon uh, Hanukkah, and let me just take this away for you now, is the fact that uh, there was a guy called Antiochus Epiphanes. He rose up, and uh, he had a number of wars going on. And, of course, the land of Israel, Judah, was in between. Of course, but like we said, by that time, Israel took captive and, and so on. But the land of the Holy Land was in between uh, what Antiochus was doing. And so he came back and forth. Well, at one point, he came in there and ransacked uh, Jerusalem and so on. And he put up a pig, uh, well, he put up an image in the temple and then sacrificed a pig, or not just one pig, pigs, on the uh, altar of the temple. So the Jews, what happened is that they, they, they there was the mock at being revolt, and you can read that in the apocryphal books. Uh, the most reliable one is First Maccabees. Don't don't go by Second Maccabees, but the the most reliable one is First Maccabees, 
and you can read about that uh, in that book. But the, uh, the there was the Maccabean revolt, and they got rid of Antiochus Epiphanes, and then they want to once again reestablish the temple. Now, by the way, by the time there was like three and a half years, think about it, three and a half years from when Antiochus messed with the temple to the time that Israel was liberated, Judah was liberated, and so on, by the Maccabean revolt, and then the temple was able to be dedicated again, rededicated. Now, they had that dedication service, uh, but the thing is, they only had enough oil for seven days. So, the, the festival of Hanukkah, the festival of light, celebrates the fact that God provided that the lamps that were in the temple at that time, that, that specific lamp that had you lit, that stayed lit with the oil it already had for seven days. Wow. Seven days, and they count that as a miracle, and that's what the miracle of Hanukkah is about, a festival of lights. Now, this has great bearing upon us. In fact, the time that uh, this was dedicated, of course, was during what we call a lot of times our Christmas season, but the Jews have a lunar calendar. We have a solar calendar, and so sometimes Hanukkah is on different dates way away from Christmas. In fact, I think it was 2012 that it occurred just on Thanksgiving. That was wild. And I thought, man, if that's not significant for our time. And listen, the Lord is coming back. So you have this. Now this happened about a century, a little bit more than a century and a half before Christ was born. And then, of course, before, just as Christ was born, Rome was the governing power at the time. And, uh, and that's who was in charge. Rome had puppet kings, one of which was Herod the Great, uh, that we read about in God's Word. And in the Lord's time, uh, after he was born and he grew up and so on, uh, many of the religious leaders at that time uh, were in cahoots with Rome. So uh, politics and religion was mixing, you could say. People say politics and religion don't mix. They mix pretty well. <laughs> and sometimes it's lethal. <laughs> <laughs> dangerous. More about that some other time. Now, so uh, we had that there, and uh, so th th there were re religious leaders that uh, came on the scene, uh, other Pharisees, the Sadducees, and so on, different people like that, and they began to teach away from God's Word and teach stuff that wasn't there uh, and would add to God's word, more so probably the Sadducees, because the Pharisees were the ones that tried to stay true to God's word. But the situation with the Pharisees, they would add stipulations to what the word of God said you and I are to do, and they would add stuff to it. Uh, and the, the, the Sadducees just didn't believe it. They just didn't believe it at all. Uh, angels and so on, they did not believe in resurrection. In our time, we have a similar situation. There is great spiritual darkness and all. And so there's all sorts of people out there saying, oh, what, thousands of religions, thousands of beliefs, and so on. And they kind of creep into our society and all. Those that uh, you, you go out somewhere and you think you're getting great exercise at a yoga place. In fact, there's like a, uh, well, it ain't really a yoga place itself, but they practice yoga there. Not too far from uh, the river at 415 Academy Street. It's right behind the river. <laughs> That's the name of the church where we attend and so on, and not just attend, well, sorry, we don't attend the river, we are, uh, we rent from the river, and so Cornerstone meets there at 7 p.m. on Sunday nights and Thursday nights. So, but here, here's this, well, I, I forget what they call it, I think uh, trade winds or something like that, uh, may not be trade winds, but they, they have a certain name for it, but they have this Hindu influence, uh, and of course that comes through yoga, and if lots of people think yoga is okay, please do some research on that uh, by solid Christians. I could do that, but I, I have, I'm have i spending my time in other areas. But there is great research upon that. And uh, listen, you don't need yoga to learn how to stretch and learn how to meditate and learn how to calm down. You just need Jesus. Amen? If you want to stretch, praise God. Oh, that felt good. Praise the Lord. Amen? Amen. So we have all this stuff going on now. We have all sorts of prophets. Some are true. Some are not true and so on. We have all sorts of translations uh, that are out there. And uh, 
people have said, oh, they're all the same. No, they're not. You have looked at them all. <laughs> There's some real terrible ones out there. And so, no, no, you stick to something that's literal. We Right now, we're using the New King James at Cornerstone Assembly Independent Pentecostal, and I recommend that you do too. And so, uh, that's a good one to use. But there's all these voices that people can tap into. And back in Isaiah's day, when we just read here about the darkness, uh, he told the people, he admonished the people to turn to the Word of God. And we can see that over in Isaiah chapter 8, verse 20. To the law, to the testimony. If they do not speak according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Amen. To the law and to the testimony. And he's talking about God's word, the law, along with the law inside there, uh, the, the books of Moses, you might call it. Uh, there's also the testimonies. You have the historical books and also the testimonies of the prophets, uh, the testimonies of the poetical books, you might say. And so you had all that in there. And so Isaiah, by the Spirit, said, go to the law and the testimony. My friend, I encourage you to read the Bible completely from front to cover in a good translation. Know it and so on, because there's lots of stuff out there. I get phone calls every now and then, people... Say, did you know this person says this, this person says that? And, and sometimes they'll, they'll quote a person, and they they mention something that this person said that's completely, not completely, but it's it just gets away from God's Word. It just gets away from God's Word. And sad to say, a lot of people have not read God's Word, and uh, they listen to other people, what people say about God's Word. Don't do that. Read God's Word for yourself. And always go to the law and the testimony. And the Word of God, the written Word of God. Now, so, uh, getting back now to our time. In our time, there is a level of spiritual darkness, which probably will lead to deep spiritual darkness during the Great Tribulation. It's getting dark now, spiritually, but it will be really dark during the Great Tribulation. Jesus said the night comes when no man can work. Now, I believe that the rapture will occur, However, if we're here, when you read that verse in John, uh, the night comes when no man can work. All right, you and I might not be able to do any work for God, but we can still worship and praise God. And so if I'm wrong about the pre-trip rapture and we're all here <laughs> uh, and we can't do much, I intend just to worship God. Amen. And, uh, and not just do that only, but also to intercede that, that sinners might get saved. People will and can, they can't get saved during a great tribulation period. Uh, please look at Revelation. It indicates that. But let me go on unless I get off this track again. We mentioned about Hanukkah, what was uh, going on there, why the Jews celebrate that, and so on. And we mentioned that uh, before the temple was rededicated, the reason why it had to be rededicated was the fact that Antiochus Epiphanes uh, came in there, just ransacked Jerusalem, and uh, sacrificed a pig on the altar, of Sal, I think it was, and uh, also put up an image of Zeus in the temple. And so that desecrated the temple, so it had to be cleansed and all that, and rededicated. Now, if anyone foreshadowed the Antichrist, uh, Antiochus Epiphanes did so very much. Okay, Now, he was not the Antichrist. You could say he was an Antichrist, but he's not the Antichrist. And you, if you think I'm off base, please read, I think it's First John chapter 2, where John the Apostle states by the Holy Spirit that many antichrists have come into the world. Many. But there is one that's rising up. Now, the word antichrist is only used in First John. Uh, we equate that term, though, with the beast of Revelation and also the man of sin over, I think it's First Thessalonians chapter 2. So, but the thing is, he Antiochus was the, the you know the, the, the foreshadow, you might say, of the Antichrist, and you no, know, he didn't fulfill that prophecy because Jesus himself indicated that the temple uh, is going to be desecrated again, and so now we await for the temple to be built. When you hear that they're going to start building a temple out in Jerusalem, 
then you know the time is at hand. I was hoping that the, you know if the Trump administration would continue on, they will make an inroad of peace over in uh, Jerusalem and so on, Israel. But you know what? God does not need the United States to get things going. Amen? He could do it without the United States. Uh, as a side note, uh, before the election, I heard that Mr. Biden liked or we want to keep going with Trump's peace plan in the Middle East. So we'll see what happens. And, and God has a great plan. But when you hear about that temple, it's going to be built again. You know the time is at hand. Definitely. And if you're not ready, I encourage you to be ready. Even right now, don't wait for the temple to be built. You could die tonight. Amen. Die right now. But uh, so, if we are truly saved by Christ, then we will want to join him as the light of the world. Now, the Jews celebrate the festival of lights. Uh, when Jesus was teaching and preaching, he said that he's the light of the world, but also he said we're the light of the world, too. We're saying we're the light of the world. And so, you know, we read about gloom and so on and, and darkness in verse 22 of chapter 8. But there needs to be a shining. And we have a mission uh, before the great tribulation comes along, we have a mission to shine. But of course, we have to do so through the power of Jesus Christ. Now, uh, let's now go back to our scripture. And uh, we want to look at the shining. And uh, let me find that again. And by the way, I'm thinking of getting uh, an external camera so I could keep the laptop on my uh, lap and look at this stuff and uh, so I don't have to pause like this and what am I doing what am I hitting and so on and uh, let me just transfer that back over to you and we're going to roll that down and probably hopefully with an external camera uh, I will be able to do this more smoothly so now we want to go to uh, verses 1 and 2 of chapter Nine of Isaiah. Nevertheless, the gloom will not be upon her who is distressed, as when at first he lightly esteemed the land of Zebulon and the land of Naphtali, and afterward more heavily oppressed her by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan in Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death on them a light has shined. Amen. Hallelujah. Zebulun means exalted. And of course, uh, Zebulon was south, uh, uh, it was south <laughs> of and borders Naphtali, Naphtala, Naphtali. And they're both, they were both up in the northern portion of Israel. And uh, by the way, that area was prone to attack from the north. So uh, that's one reason why they were in danger at times. And they sat in the shadow of death, you could say. But yet, Zebulon means exalted. And by the way, Zebulon is that territory where Nazareth would be in the future. Nazareth, where Christ would grow up. Amen. And he was born in Bethlehem, but grew up in Nazareth. And so he had a humble beginning, but he would be exalted by the Father. Now, Naphtali, and however you want to say that, I'm going to have to look that up one of these days for sure, but uh, that means wrestling, and some people wrestle. Now, uh, when Christ came along, when he was born, uh, he was presented in the temple, and uh, Simeon came along, and he said, he prophesied, and said that this child is destined for the rise and fall of many in Israel. And so that's the case. Many people will be wrestling with the situation. Uh, should, I, you know, should I commit my life to God through Christ and so on? It, it, that is something to think about. You should think about that. And it's something to be weighed. It's not just the fact that, okay, well, I'm going to escape from hell. Well, listen, my friend, it also means you're going to have to escape from your sin. And that's why people wrestle with this stuff as time goes on, because they don't want to give up their sin. Uh, they want to hang on to their sin. 
And so they don't want to give it up. And so they wrestle with this stuff. And once you're saved, then you come along, you walk along with Christ, and the Lord says, now I want you to behave this way better, or do this and so on. And we wrestle with things like that. Oh, go forgive that person. People wrestle with that stuff a lot of times. Uh, so, uh, no, we need to stop wrestling and start trusting. Amen. Amen. So, now, Jesus Christ of course, was that light that was to come, as we have just read over in Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. He was that light that was to come, and that was to shine. And uh, we have a prophecy, I think this might have been uh, Zacharias, over in Luke chapter 1, verse 79, and it reads as follows, uh, To give light to them that sit in darkness, and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet, unto or into the way of peace. And I should have kept up the other graphic on there for you so we can get to the next scripture. So, uh, But let me do that again. And we'll just transfer that back over to you. And then we're going to read, was it Matthew, is it? Coming up next, Matthew uh, chapter 4. Here it is, Matthew chapter 4, verses 16, I think, to uh, 12 to 16. 12 to 16, there we go. Matthew 4, 12 to 16. Now when Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he departed to Galilee, and leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is by the sea, in the regions of Zebulon and Naphtali, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, The land of Zebulon and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, People who sat in darkness have seen a great light, and upon those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has dawned. Amen. Praise the Lord. And, of course, Christ is that light. And like we said before, this is one thing that Jesus attaches to us also. He calls us the light of the world. He's the light of the world, and we, too, are the light of the world. And now we get to the sharing. Now, that's the shining. Now, here's the sharing, the share it. And that's verse 3. You have multiplied the nation and increased its joy. They rejoice before you according to the joy of harvest, as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. As when they divide the spoil. Now, when Christ came to live, die, and rise again for us, he lived the life that we're supposed to live. And on the cross, he, I would say before the cross, he took our sins. I believe right in the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, they were beginning to be placed upon him. That's why he was sweating in such a way, like, like great drops of blood and so on. Big drops of sweat and so on. And so he was sweating profusely, and then he goes to the cross, and of course at the cross, he is punished for my sin and your sin. But that's done so we can be partakers of his victory and walk in his victory, and so on. And more than that, by the way, we're going to see more than that, uh, that uh, not just to, to, to save us so we get out of hell, but it's we're saved to serve God. Let my people go that they may serve me. And so over in Psalm 68, verse 18, which is mine, uh, thou hast descended on high, thou hast led captivity captive, you have given, have received gifts to men. I'm sorry. Thou hast received gifts for men. Yes, for the rebellious also, that Yahweh God may dwell among them. Amen. And so he gives gifts to men. Now that passage is further explained over in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 7 to 14. I'll bring it back up here. Here we go. All right. For to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to man. Now this, he ascended, what does it mean but that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, 
some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature, stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children, tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine, but the tr trickery by the trickery of man in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. Now, I want to, to talk about some things here. Uh, somebody might say what this means, that uh, he who has said also descended. And I feel that they talk about that because we did mention first Maccabees before. Uh, when Christ was on the earth ministering, when someone would die, everybody went to the same general location. It was called Sheol. Sometimes it's called hell, but it's basically it's the grave, the grave. Everyone went to the grave, not just the physical grave, but they went to the spiritual grave. When we look at Luke 16, we see the account of the rich man and Lazarus, and we see that within the grave there were two areas, a place of torment, and then it was also a place of pleasure. And so you had those two areas. So everyone that had died before Christ died upon the cross, they were there. And what happened was, after he died upon the cross, before he raised was raised from the dead, uh, he went into the grave and he proclaimed who he was and so on. And by the way, I'm not making this up. I think this is First Peter chapter 2. If it's not First Peter 2, it's First Peter 3. Yeah, I think it's First Peter 3. But if you look that up at First Peter 3, you'll see it. He goes down to the grave, he proclaims who he is, and then he leads captivity captive. In other words, th there were some people that would believe on him in the grave, and he would take them into glory with him. So you had that. Now, the reason why I say that is because over First Maccabees, remember, First Maccabees was written before Christ died upon the cross, before Christ ever showed up. And so, uh, and the Jews were praying for the departed dead. And, but now there's no need to do that anymore because the departed dead have made their choice. And some have gone to be with Christ and some have stayed there. And now when someone dies, you either go directly into the presence of Christ or you go directly to hell. And so <laughs> that's the situation that there's no need to pray for the dead anymore in our time. Why? Because Christ paid the price. It's been done in our time. And so that's no need, there's no need for that. Now the other part, is that he gave gifts to men, and uh, it goes on here, uh, he, he gave some apostles, some prophets, and by the way, there's still apostles today, uh, but there's false and there's real. I look at many of our missionaries as apostles. Apostle means one who is sent. And I, I know there's some preachers out there that have all these stipulations taken from Acts chapter 1, Acts chapter 1, those stipulations were given before the day of Pentecost. And so, and I don't think Paul really fulfilled all those stipulations in chapter 1, literally. You have to do some stretching there for Paul to fulfill it. So, uh, the apostles are still around today, but there's false and there's real. And sometimes you can tell a false prophet when they attach that title to the name. Many times, many times. Prophets, same way with prophets. Uh, when uh, people tout themselves as prophets, then you can might wonder if they're not false. Uh, so beware of that. But there are true prophets, and some evangelists, and those that proclaim the good news, also bring encouragement to brothers and sisters in Christ. And, and unlike some evangelists today, okay, <laughs> the evangelists of the first century were not like the ones that we have today for the most part. And then some pastors and teachers, those words come together in that clause, in that phrase. So a pastor and teacher uh, in that respect, and that's what we are. Amen. Pastors and teachers. And what's it for? For the perfecting of the saints. But also it goes, uh, if we read First Corinthians chapter 12, we see that there are the gifts of God's Holy Spirit. I believe they're in still they're still in operation today, and they're still valid for today. And so, my friend, if you're saved, I encourage you to seek what fruit, what gift, 
not all, what fruit, but what gift of the Spirit that you would have. You should have all the fruits, <laughs> every, every last one of the fruits, so on. But uh, you should uh, seek the Lord as to what gift or gifts he would have you in, ministering in, and so on. And now we get to the shattering, and let me move this back up for you on the screen. So we get, that's number four there, Roman numeral number four, the shattering. And that would be Isaiah chapter 9, verses 4 to 6. For you have broken the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, as in the day of Midian. For, for every warrior's sandal from the noisy battle and garments rolled in blood will be used for burning and fuel of fire. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Hallelujah. Now, of course, for this message, I just used the first part. It's not that I don't believe in the other part, but I want to emphasize the first part. But you do see uh, here that Christ will come back. Now, he, he already was here to take away my sin and your sin. And I want to concentrate upon that. That's why I kind of stopped there. Uh, for unto us a child. Let me help with this say here. Uh, in verse 6. For a child will be born to us. A son will be given to us. And so I, I want to stop there. So to emphasize that. Why? Because if we do not emphasize this. What should I say? What we need to have. Then we're not going to be ready for when Christ does come back. It is a fact that Christ is coming back, but we have to be ready for him to come back. Now, the passage that we just had mentioned the fact about Gideon and the days of Gideon and so on, and then about later on, uh, uh, the battle and so on. But the, it, looking at the, the, the battle that Gideon was in, and not the other one that's talking about this time, uh, which talks about the future, but it touched upon what Gideon uh, was doing and so on, how he was used by God, and there's a whole, you all read the story. Sad to say, Gideon did not stay true to God after this great victory, but uh, nonetheless, uh, he did have a victory, and uh, I think it was against the Midianites, and uh, at first he had a very large army, and then God said, it's too big, and then you know the story, you know, and then finally it was brought down to 300 guys. <laughs> just 300 and there, there's like tens of thousands of nights all around the place and all that and then so uh, lo and behold I guess it was, what, uh, what happened I don't guess but I know God gave him this plan whereby that uh, not, what I'm trying to say is that he didn't say maybe directly to him but this is what came to getting his mind that to take some torches put them in, in uh, vessels and so on and surround the Midianites basically and then at a certain point, smash those things and say, the sword of the Lord and a Midian. <laughs> and of course, uh, the, the Midians were routed and so on, and they fled away. And uh, that shows you the power of God. Now, think about the torches inside those vessels, those clay, those clay vessels and so on. There was a shattering, okay? When Christ comes in, he wants to shatter our sin nature. Now, it's been shattered upon the cross. But we've got to agree that shattering, and we've got to agree to let God's Holy Spirit flow through us. So there's got to be a shattering in there. And then once the shattering takes place, then the light shows forth more vividly all the time. You might see some light coming out at the bottom of the vessel and so on. But until you shatter that vessel, you're not going to see much light at all. And so that, that's got to be taken care of. Now, if you're not saved... Uh, Christ wants to redeem you from your past life and your sins and all that. And he wants to bring that the shattering to your life that that light might shine within you. He is the light of the world. And that sin nature has got to go. And uh, let's bring up another passage for you. Let's now look at John chapter 8, verse 12. And Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. I hope you want that, and friend, if you're saved, I hope you want to keep that. You can lose that, by the way. You can snuff out your own candle. Amen. 
Now, of course, he can blot you out, too. And, oh, no, yeah, that's what it says over, I think it's over in Revelation chapter 3. If not 3, it's chapter 2. is one of those seven churches. He says, if you overcome, I will not blot your name out. I will not blot it out from the book of life. I will not blot out your name from the book of life. So, the Lord said that to one of the churches. So, evidently, it can be in the book of life, and it can be blotted out. You don't want that light to be blotted out at all. Amen. Nor do you want to grow dim. So we have that. Uh, we, if, we, if you come to Christ, you want to stay in him and you want to follow him and not walk in darkness. You know, until a person gets saved, they are walking in darkness. They, they might think they're okay. They might have religion uh, or they might have a certain idea how to be saved, but they're completely happy. And you could be happy all you want, but still go to hell. That's that's very sad. Uh, Christ wants you and I to do it His way, which is He is the way. And we need to come to Him and let Him shatter our vessel, you might say, our sin nature, and let His light shine through us. Now, as, and also, uh, we can have that victory right now. We do that. By having Christ come in. In other words, you could be released from homosexuality. You could be released from drug usage. You could be released from any oppression that you're facing right now. There's some people yeah. that are being terribly oppressed. They're in sadness. They're in gloom and so on. But Christ came to set you free. You don't have to be entrapped with darkness. Let it go and come to Christ. Uh, just come to Christ even now. And he'll set you free. And then, of course, there is that final victory to come. And... And we'll mention that now, the fact that Christ will come back, and we feel that is very near, because many things have happened since 1948, when Israel became a nation again. Many things have happened that set the stage for Christ coming back in the clouds and so on, and setting up his kingdom for a thousand years on earth. Now, we could talk about that. In fact, that, that a lot of people like to hear prophecy, and that's good. But we need to attach that to our lives, apply it to our lives. Am I ready? Am I ready? Are you ready? And so on. So we need to apply it to our lives. And the only way to be ready is to have Christ on the inside of you. And that's why I'm emphasizing this last, this, well, the first part of verse 6 of Isaiah chapter 9. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Amen. He wants to come into your life right now and change you. And friend, if you're saved, keep just keep him there. Just 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 you know just keep him there. Amen. And let him grow. Obey his word, obey his spirit in your life. Obey what he tells you to do. Follow through and love him more every day. And so we encourage you to come to him. This child was for you and for me that we might have a fresh start in life. Now, Christian, if you're oppressed with gloom, and some are, some some Christians, you know, some years back, I, I, I had problems with depression myself. So, if you're oppressed with gloom, sadness, spiritual defeat, you know, some Christians, they keep falling down. Uh, they keep being entrapped in sin. Uh, well, I encourage you to get out of the shadow of death. Just get out from under the shadow of death and get close to Christ. Listen, confess your sins before him. He's faithful and just to forgive you. He will cleanse you of your unrighteousness and he'll make you new again. And so you follow him and when you get back to him, then make sure that you, you determine in your heart that you will never want to leave him again. Amen. And my friend, if you're not saved, we encourage you to come to Christ even now. And you can do so by making a true commitment to him. And we always help people along that line. Now, if you want to make a true commitment to Jesus Christ, you got to mean this. And you got to realize you're going to forsake sin. You will want to forsake sin, and he'll help you to do that. And, you know, sometimes it gets difficult, but he'll help you to forsake sin and self. If you want to come to Christ, please pray this prayer. I mean, a Father... Forgive me, I am a sinner. I ask Christ to come in. I surrender all that I am to him. I give my all, Father, help me, Lord, to live for you, I pray, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 
Now, if you have prayed that prayer and have meant it, we have a number of things on the internet for you that will help you to grow in Jesus Christ. And one of the things is that we have a recording titled Seven Rich for Growth in Christ. Seven Rich for Growth in Christ. You'll find that uh, on our Sapphire Streams page uh, where it says audio resources, audio and visual resources now. And so look there for Seven Rich for Growth in Christ. And also, we have a series of lessons for you, Basic Elements of Christianity. The, uh, the address is on your screen now. SapphireStreams.com forward slash BEC forward slash SapphireStreams.com forward slash BEC forward slash all lowercase letters. And so we have those things for you. And one of the things that we teach in that lesson is that, well, we, for one thing, and like we said, service for growth in Christ, that too, is the fact that, you know, along with praying and worshiping God every day, not just in church, but worshiping and praying God every day, uh, you want to be baptized in water, you, you want to start obeying God. If you're not, you, know, you need to be baptized in water. And so uh, please, please make arrangements to do so if you got saved. But another thing is to be with other Christians. Now, that might be more difficult in these last days. <laughs> but the thing is, with that, we will have service night, Lord willing, at the river, 415 of Cambridge Street, Cambridge, Maryland, and we'll be studying the Gospel of John. We'll be in Sanctuary too. We are not affiliated with the river. We just ran from them. That's 415 of Cambridge Street in Cambridge, Maryland. Then also, we meet again on Thursday nights to have a Bible study. And we're looking at Song of Solomon. We'll be in Song of Solomon chapter 2, the, the end part of chapter 2 this week, God willing. So please join us once again, 7 p.m. at 415 Academy Street, the River Sanctuary 2. Sanctuary 2. We're not associated with the river. We're, we, you know, we want to be independent and listening to the Lord. And there's other reasons too. But uh, now, as our habit is, we want to pray for the per persecuted. My nose is getting stuffed up. And I can't get off camera to take care of my nose. I don't, I don't want to blow my nose on <laughs> while I'm doing this. Amen. And while I do this, I want to bring up this too for you. You can, you have time to give a Christmas gift to the persecuted. And some of these are quite pricey, but listen, you ought to do that instead of getting a tattoo. Okay. Think about it. Yeah, or, or, you know, or send money to the Gideons and so on. So Bibles get out there. And so but a lot of people spend money on themselves, stuff like that. Lay up treasure from heaven for yourself, amen? And spend on Bibles and, and the persecuted and so on. Now our first request this morning is for Nigeria. And by the way, this is, this is almost every week with Nigeria, with Boko Haram and people like that. Nigeria is just out of whack and so you know when she mentioned this also be praying that Nigeria will get their act together and take care of their people so you get read that we'll pray for it an attack by suspected Boko Haram militants in Borno state Nigeria claimed the lives of 110 farmers who were working in their fields on November 28 this attack is believed to be the deadliest by the group in all of 2020 especially against civilians. The attackers rode on motorcycles and shot villagers who were working in their fields that day. Pray for comfort and peace for the families that are grieving. And pray for this community to rebuild following this attack. Pray for the authorities to quickly apprehend the attackers. Jesus, I just pray this morning for these individuals, for the families uh, in particular that have lost loved ones pray that you might comfort them. I pray that you might also meet their needs. As I'm sure that a lot of them, as they were out working in the fields, they were providing for their family, perhaps uh, with gardens or whatever, or, or to uh, pr provide for their family financially. Lord, I just pray that you might just be with the uh, family members that remained and pray that you might encourage them, give them strength. pray that you might just... Uh, continue supplying their needs also. Lord, I pray for uh, Boko Haram that you might uh, convict him. Pray them. That, that, it's a group. Yeah, pray that you might uh, convict the, the group there. 
that you might help them to also to get saved and help them to see that uh, they will also be affected by this if uh, if the farmers won't be able to farm anymore. Lord, I just pray that you might just uh, help the government to uh, be able to control this better. Pray that you might just uh, meet the needs throughout Nigeria. Lord, I thank you for uh, providing for us in America. Pray that you might help us to continually serve you so that uh, we might uh, honor you. Pray that you might help us to uh, help others to find you also. And this we ask in your name and for your sake. Amen. Pakistan from ICC. According to local reports, a Christian teen in Pakistan named Shiza has recently returned to her family after being abducted and abused by a group of Muslim men. To cover their crimes, Shiza's abductors forcibly converted her to Islam and married her to one of the assailants. Now, let me say something about that. I don't think that type of marriage is valid. If someone would come to my office and they were from Pakistan, they say, no, I was forcibly married. To, and I'd say, that that's not a marriage. It's, it's got, please read what I got about marriage on my marriage pages at uh, oasishope.org. I'm sorry, oasishope.neocities.org. And it's, read about that, okay? It you no no way no it, 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 a person not married just because of an act of a government, <laughs> and, and or in this case an act of uh, militants, evil people. No, no way. So, uh, uh, but you you just bear that in mind, and and just think about Isaac, okay? What government agency was there? To, to marry Isaac and Rebecca or anybody else in God's work. Right? Right. All right, so Shiza was held captive by doctors for nearly for two months. Pray for healing for Shiza following this traumatic experience. Pray for protection for her family from future attacks. Pray for Shiza's abductors to be arrested and held accountable. And Father, we do pray for Shiza that you help her, Lord, to be healed emotionally, spiritually, physically from this terrible time that she had. We ask, oh God, that you help her send your precious Holy Spirit, your healing virtue, and help her, Lord, just to relax in you and love you with her whole heart, so and mind. Uh, we pray for her family, that you protect them and so on. And not just her family, but herself also, but uh, uh, pray that you protect these people. And we pray for these perpetrators, the abductors, and so on, to be arrested and to be held accountable as they should be. And pray. we also pray that Pakistan changes some of its laws and that, that it would be more sensible in that country. We pray for our country, Father, that you help us, Lord, to stay true. Well, let me say this one, I stay true. We've, we've gone away from your word when it comes to law and stuff like that. Helps to get back to your word and to follow it. And, and not just also in our governments, but also many of our churches that say they're Christian, but yet they are now following your word. And we ask, oh God, that you just uh, draw people to you. We ask revival. Uh, we pray that you just meet the needs. We pray for those that are sick this morning, that have suffered from different things. For those that have COVID, coronavirus, we ask, oh God, that you just touch your bodies and heal them. And help the Lord seek your favor and face and help them, Lord, to send your healing virtue even now. For those that are depressed, they are sorrowful, they, they face sadness right now. Help them, Lord, to hear your word and to trust you even now. Help them, Lord, to turn to you if they're not saved. And for those that are saved, help them, Lord, to also to turn to you. And look steadfastly at you, we pray. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you for joining us. God willing, we'll be at the river tonight at 415 at Cambridge Street, Cambridge, Maryland. And we will be studying the Gospel of John at the 7 p.m. service in Sanctuary 2. We're not affiliated with the river. And then once again, 7 p.m. Thursday night at the river, 415 Cambridge Street, Cambridge, Maryland, Sanctuary 2. And so join for that. We'll be studying Song of Solomon. We thank you for coming by and watching and share this video with others, and uh, we look forward to seeing you again, and 
Above all, we look forward to seeing Jesus Christ. So we say, Maranatha! Maranatha.